Welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. In this interview, I had the privilege of talking with Greg Johnson of Memorial Presbyterian in St. Louis. Now, Pastor Johnson and uh, his church has, have recently left the denomination that I am currently in, due in part to some of the issues uh, that we talk about in this episode, uh, issues of identifying as a gay Christian. You can go ahead and do your research. I'm not going to hash all of that out here. Um, but I would definitely recommend that you read his book, Still Time to Care, and listen to our discussion here to understand some of the key aspects of his stance. Um, and so as you research the issue, uh, you can kind of figure out what uh, what took place and, and where you stand, perhaps. And I thought Pastor Johnson would be a great interview because it's been really hard to line up conservative guests, and he actually graciously agreed to an interview. Plus, as someone who is pushing back both against the gay lifestyle and the anti-gay conservatives, I thought that he'd be a really good voice to color the discussion on how the church has used propaganda in regard to the gay community. Because at least in my book, he has, uh, you know, he should have a little bit of credibility for both sides. If you're somebody who doesn't believe that uh, a gay lifestyle is moral, and then he holds that position, and he is a celibate gay man, and hopefully you can hear him out. At the same time, if you are somebody who thinks that those uh, Christians are kooks and bigots, and they, um, you know, they just hate gay people, you know, here we have a a gay man who is able to talk from a religious perspective. So I think Pastor Johnson is a a wonderful person to have on to discuss this topic of propaganda as as it comes to um, Christianity and the gay community. But as usual, before we get into the interview, I want to point out a few things that I want you to be on the lookout for. First, pretty much right off the bat, Pastor Johnson is going to give you a really good and succinct history of how the scientific and medical communities have handled gay men and women, at least in the past century. And we covered a bit of this in our previous episode, but It'll be good to hear again as kind of a recap, and it's a, it's a good short place to get that. One thing you have to understand from our section on medical propaganda here is that science is not some beneficent or even neutral endeavor. It's often very biased, and it's often wielded very violently, all while being packaged as benevolent. Second, much of what we discuss in this episode is centered around the use um, or appearance of dressing up language or dressing up actions without true transformation or relationship. The discussion will be a good one to kind of tuck away because after we conclude our next section on government, we're going to pave a path to a discussion on discipleship transformation, what I think is the true propaganda killer. And I think that this discussion uncovers very well, as just one example, how conservative Christians have sought power and control through the objectification of others, through the manipulation of language and the legerdemain of untransformed action. Or, as we talk about in this episode, kind of putting a paint job over over some rust, right? Just kind of dressing it up and making it look good, even though it's not. So there's a lot in regard to propaganda here that, that uh, we get into. Finally, as a Christian... I definitely don't want you to miss the gospel in this episode. Pastor Johnson beautifully points over and over again to how the gospel has transformed him and still drives him to love and to self-sacrifice. While we talk about a lot of problems the church has in this episode, and I've talked a lot about the church's problems throughout this season, we only do that because we want the church to be what it ought to be. We want it to be purified so that it can be the hands and feet of Christ. And please don't hear only our critique of the church, but rather look beyond that to a depiction of what the church ought to be, a living model of the gospel of Jesus. So if you pay attention for these three elements, I think that you'll walk away from this episode edified and informed. So here it is, my interview with Pastor Greg Johnson. And so maybe first of all, you could just give a a brief introduction as to uh, who you are and, um, you know, kind of some of your, your background for the topic that we're, we're uh, going to discuss here. 
Yeah, I'm Greg Johnson. I'm a senior pastor at Memorial Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, 50 years old, unmarried, celibate, um, grew up atheist in suburban D.C. My father worked for the, was a senior executive in the U.S. federal government. And uh, I, uh, you know, I was the gay kid and then became a Christian in college while studying architecture at the University of Virginia uh, and was led to Christ really through the ministry of, of what then was Campus Crusade for Christ. Today, it's crew. And um, very started devouring everything I could find theologically, took classical Greek at UVA just so I could learn to read the New Testament in Greek. And then, you know, my campus minister who was you know, the first person I came out to as a, as a young believer, um, as a, a new Christian, you know, he, he was the guy who mentored me and developed me, poured into me, loved me, and ultimately was the first person to, to encourage me to go to seminary. Um, continued on, did a PhD at St. Louis University in historical theology. Uh, my dissertation was on the historical and theological development of the quiet time in Anglo-American devotional practice in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And I uh, am author of a couple books, uh, The World According to God, A Biblical View of Culture, Work, Science, Sex, and Everything Else, InterVarsity Press 2002. And then um, uh, the more recently, Still Time to Care, What We Can Learn from the Church's Failed Attempt to Cure Homosexuality. I'm a contributor to USA Today and Christianity Today and a couple other places, but mostly I just love shepherding my church right here in the heart of the city of St. Louis. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so a little bit of, of my background that, um, you know, is going to be pertinent for the first question that I have for you. Uh, I grew up in a, in a Christian school, um, fundamentalist Christian, uh, conservative Christian, and so we were, we were uh, very skeptical of science growing up, uh, and uh, we were we were I won't name any names, but we were uh, very into you know probably some of the people that you can imagine that go along with that. Um, and so were, were were there dinosaurs on the ark? Yeah, yeah, things like that. Um, and you know, great, you know, th that's great, but there was a skepticism of science that came along with that. And so anything that that came down the pipes, if it had to do with uh, things like global warming, or if the earth was older than yeah, 6,000 years old, or things like that, we just we couldn't accept that. But it seemed like there was a, um, you know, a double standard, because there were other things that we would be able to accept, you know, like, um, if, if, uh, science seemed to show that religion uh, extended your life because it made people happier or whatever. We're like, oh yeah, see science, science proves this. So we kind of had this, this double standard. Um, one of the double standards that it seems like, I feel like you uncover and are familiar with is uh, in regard to some of the, the science that deals with, um, with gay people. And uh, you talk a little bit about conversion therapy, which has historically been very popular in, in Christianity, especially conservative Christianity. And it's, um, it's something that we don't really use the term today, but you'll still see inklings of its use and maybe disguised as a different name today in, uh, in, in a lot of conservative Christianity. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit, first of all, about maybe your, your view of science and religion, whether those things are compatible and if you if you can value science and then lead that into um, what do we know about conversion therapy and, and how that seems to work out? Yeah, I mean, um, when you consider science, it really has its, its origins at creation when God made the cosmos uh, separate and distinct from himself out of nothing. And then when you see in the creation narrative in Genesis, where, where God takes Adam and he places him in the garden, and then he has Adam uh, look at and name each animal. Um, and, and what he's doing is he's creating human categories within which various things will be organized and understood. You know, that's very much the, the, the founding of the scientific enterprise of, of 
examining the world as it is, is seeking to understand it and seeking to give things names and categories that relate to what they actually are as a part of God's good creation. And, uh, and so, you know, certainly, you know, as Christians, we, we have an overall paradigm that is established by, you know, the narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, that the world was made good. It has fallen now. Um, and, and therefore that goodness in places has been lost more so in some areas than in others. And yet it's still an understandable cosmos, albeit a fallen one that has already begun to experience redemption with Jesus becoming incarnate as a permanent part of creation. The incarnation is permanent. He is at the right hand of the father uh, physically being the locus of our salvation. And then, and then he's coming again to make everything right again. And, and so within that framework, you know, Christians should be able to ask questions, make, you know, hypotheses, test hypotheses, come to conclusions. Science is limited. There are certain things science can't tell you. Science cannot tell you whether or not Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, you know, because science is the examination uh, of repeatable events. And history is unrepeatable. And so as humans, we have another category of knowledge and, 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 and academic study and endeavor that we call history. And, uh, and, you know, that's much more where my training is as a historical theologian. But uh, yeah, and as it comes to, to issues of sexual orientation, you know, there has been no end to speculation, even going back to antiquity over why some people are gay or same-sex attracted or whatever term you want to use, um, why some people are inverted to use a nice, you know, early 20th century term that nobody seems to have too much stock in these days. Um, you know, uh, in antiquity, it was hypothesized that it was because, you know, you were born under a certain, you know, uh, uh, a certain star, a certain sign. Um, you know, others had various hypotheses and those hypotheses always carried with them by implication, uh, uh, possible routes of fixing it and making everybody straight. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's been everything from, I mean, you just can't, I can't go through all the examples. I mean, you know, in the earliest 20th century, right after World War One, there was a, a boom in testicle transplants among gay men in Central Europe because they hypothesized that uh, the seat of homosexuality was in the testicles. And if you could remove, castrate somebody's homosexual testicles and replace them with a straight man's testicle, he'd become straight. And, you know, one, one you know, <laughs> surgeon in Berlin uh, you know, advertised that he only used the testicles of hypersexualized men in order to give a better chance of, of, of cure. Um, the Nazis experimented on gay men, um, injecting testosterone into the uh, reproductive organs to try to see if they could um, convert somebody as a form of conversion therapy, um, having forcing gay men to basically rape uh, Roma and Jewish women, Polish women, to try to see if they could make them straight that way. Uh, after World War II in the United States, there was a boom in lobotomies for the sake of, of conversion therapy to make people straight. Um, in the early 1970s, the Advocate magazine referred to the uh, state uh, mental penitentiary in California at Tuscadero as docal for queers because those who engaged in homosexual practice, it was considered a crime at the time. They, you know, police officers would peer over the transom windows above doors of hotel rooms and arrest people for having oral sex. And then it was considered a psychiatric problem. And so they would be prisoned in a psychiatric um, prison where they would have a choice of either castration or lobotomy, where they would, you know, stick a whisk through the back of the nose and scramble the frontal lobe of the brain, which of course caused horrible, horrible damage, permanent damage. People were no longer able to feed themselves, clothe themselves, bathe themselves. That's what our government was doing to gay people during my lifetime. You know, I was born in 72. So this was happening during my lifetime. This is not ancient history. 
And among Christians, what became popular, particularly in the 19, starting in the 1980s and really becoming a big boom in the 90s, what was called reparative therapy, which was the theory advanced by Joseph Nicolosi, who was a nominally Roman Catholic, but he was a psychologist. Um, and his theory was that homosexuality itself is a desire to repair the broken relationship with the same sex parent. And so the thought is if you could figure out where that relationship with the same sex parent failed to affirm and, you know, strengthen uh, the, the person, then uh, you could go back and address those issues. And the result is that homosexual longings would be replaced with heterosexual longings. And, you know, the, the, the specific uh, individuals that would uh, trigger sexual temptation would switch gender. Um, there was never a single study documenting that it worked. And in fact, it did not work. And, but it was very popular, not only the, 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 the actual practice clinically, but also just this, the, these ideas seeped into conservative Christianity, both evangelical and Roman Catholic, and also very big in Mormonism for, the matter, for that fact. Um, they often led the way in these things. The language of same-sex attraction was first used by Mormon ex-gay ministries in the 1980s and then really redeemed and popularized by, by Roman Catholic conversion therapists in uh, the early late 1990s, early 2000s. But, um, but yeah, the reality is it never worked. And so by the time, you know, Alan Chambers, the last president of Exodus International, stood up in 2012 and announced that out of the you know, hundreds of thousands of clients that that had been through the various Exodus International programs and the various Exodus International affiliated ministries, um, that 99.9% .9 had seen no change in their sexual orientation. Um, you know, the, the reality is it did not work. There is something deeply rooted about what kind of people trigger uh, or occasion sexual temptation. And, uh, and so, yeah, there, there, there's, and there's a lot of science explaining what's going on with sexual orientation and why some people experience uh, or uh, attraction to the opposite, to the same sex instead of the opposite sex. And, you know, you see twin studies where, you know, if, if one identical twin is, is gay, the, his identical twin is 31% chance of also being gay, which is astronomically higher than, than one would expect if this is all in the brain. Uh, and quite a bit higher than with fraternal twins who have different DNA, but the same womb in the same home environment. And they themselves are much more likely to be all, both gay than uh, non-twin siblings who have the same home environment. And so clearly there's something genetic or epigenetic, and there's also something intrauterine going on um, and lots of studies about that. But yeah, Christians, there's a, there's a whole anti-intellectual tradition of Christians who feel threatened by knowledge. And that's a, a very weak faith that cannot handle reality. Um, you know, our understanding of scripture is also shaped by what we know of the world. You know, it's very, very common that something learned through history, secular history, sheds light on what the Bible means. It's not a one-way street. You know, it's all knowledge and truth, and certainly scripture is supreme in setting the narrative grid. But uh, yeah, that's a few thoughts. I appreciate that that history of of all of the ways that that we've kind of seen science play out. Um, because I had to read like five books to get what you just summarized in like three minutes. So, so that's a, that'll be really valuable. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, as, as you were mentioning all of those things, it kind of struck me that um, when I refer to con conversion therapy, you know, we think of um, trying to just get somebody to, to change their choices, but really like if you, if you think about all of those things you mentioned from, uh, lobotomies to forced sex to whatever, like all of those things are attempts to try to get somebody to convert, you know, to, to change their orientation. Um, it's just different ways to get them to try to convert. Um, 
But what I found really interesting was that uh, in your book, Still Time to Care, you you discuss, um, you kind of push back against this idea of um, converting gay people to a, a different orientation. And one of the things that that initially struck me is that you you named people like um, you know Lewis Graham Schaefer Stott, and how all of those those men had had compassion uh, compassionate views towards gay believers and didn't really have problem using the terminology that that it feels like we're we're trying to avoid. We don't want to call somebody gay. We want them to convert so that you know they're they're no longer gay. We don't want to use that term. Um, why do you think? Why do you think after at least a hundred years, and I'm sure that the history goes back much farther, but why why do we have this this, this desire to convert the orientation um, today so much more more strongly than we did in the past, it seems? Yeah, you know, I think we're dealing with the legacy of the ex-gay movement that started in the mid 1970s, came to fruition during the AIDS crisis of the 1980s and 1990s and then declined and collapsed uh, about 10 years ago. But that ex-gay movement that really got its start in the kind of Jesus movement, independent, charismatic spirituality of 1970s California, where everything was about miracles and everything was about healings and everything was about power religion and power encounters and you know, people being delivered from addictions and delivered from mental illness. And, you know, a woman loses or has a mastectomy and and her breasts miraculously grow back. It was totally a fraud, almost all that was. But, um, but you know, there was this heavy emphasis in, in the Jesus movement of miraculous healing. And, you know, I remember you know, one of the founders of Exodus International and, and love, uh, you know, one of the first uh, ex- Mexican ministries as well. Um, you know, he was working in a call center at Melody Land Christian Center and shared with his supervisor that um, that he was homosexual. They used it as a noun back then, um, but that he was committed to following Jesus in obedience. And, and the supervisor said, you know, you're not a homosexual. You are heterosexual in Jesus, and you need to claim your reality now. And that's where all this came from. Um, when conservative reformed people in 2023 parrot back things that the weirdest charismatic edge people were saying in 1976, then that should give us pause because you know that was it was not always that way. But what we're dealing with is is a movement that began as a charismatic fringe expectation of absolute, complete, divine deliverance from temptation, um, became mainstream in evangelicalism, and even conservative evangelicals adopted it. And, And its language and its categories have stuck. And so, you know, if I say that I am a Christian who struggles with unwanted same-sex attraction, using the language of conversion therapists there, uh, people feel that's safer than if I say, I'm just a gay guy who fell in love with Jesus and I'm celibate because I want to obey him. You know, and and in certain circles, the, the notion of progressive sanctification, people think, oh, well, you know, if I, you know, am a thief and I become a Christian, then eventually that longing to steal is going to go away. Uh, and it's just that logical to them. And yet they're comparing it to stealing, which is something completely external to us. They should instead compare it to being attracted to other women that they're not married to. Because we were not created to be stealing people, but we were created to be sexual beings. That's part of God's image in us, part of who we are as that we have this ability to enter into the creation act with God as co-creators, imaging him by making new humans through our sexuality. You know, this is something that's close to the center of our being. And there's nothing in the Bible that would suggest that in the ordinary process of spiritual growth, 
Christian men no longer feel sexual temptation toward women other than their wife. If somebody tells you that's the case, they are lying through their teeth or they had a horrible crush injury or they're just uniquely spiritual because <laughs> I'm a pastor and uh, I, I know that these sexual temptations don't go away and, and morally being attracted to your neighbor's wife is not that much spiritually better than, than being attracted to your neighbor. You know, you don't get partial credit for being straight. It's still sinful temptation inside of us, tempting us to turn away from God in order to satisfy through objectifying other people, uh, longings that we have because we want them to make us feel the way that Jesus wants to make us feel, which is loved and accepted. And so, um, yeah, you know, it just, it doesn't go away in this life. And yet the ex gay movement really beginning in kind of a, kind of a name it and claim it kind of prosperity gospel thing caught us and we bought it hook, line and sinker. And it destroyed a lot of lives. There are probably about a million people in the United States who went through some form of conversion therapy and these are people who are often very bruised, very broken, sometimes bitter. Um, they were they were sold false promises by false prophets. And when God did not deliver his what they thought he had promised because their ministry told them that he had, um, they grew disillusioned. You know, it's, it's very much like the the leukemia patient who is told that they don't really have cancer they just need to claim their healing and they'll be delivered and then when the deliverance doesn't come they feel guilty and they're wondering if they're even christians or god wasn't faithful to them god broke his promise uh it destroys souls so we, we really need to find a better way not toward curing homosexuality but but caring for people for whom this is part of their story and and help helping them with the love the community the intimacy the support that's needed to walk faithfully in obedience to god yeah, one of the the books that I read uh, in regard to that was I think Julie Rogers has a book called Out Love, and um, she was a part of the the uh, the Exodus community, and she she talks a lot about her experience and um, kind of coming out of that, and so, so that was that was very helpful in understanding that movement. But you know, she's she's also echoed one of the things that you said earlier, which is that um, those movements did make false promises and that the people who claimed that they were transformed by and large, uh, if not all of them, uh, have relapsed or in action or have, have continued to, uh, to have the same orientation. And I think you, you have, um, you know, Christian scientific researchers like, uh, Yarhouse who basically you know, is, is going to say the same thing. Um, and so one of the one of the questions that I've been struggling through is, uh, on the one hand, I believe that that language is very important um, because language can um, it can create ideas, it can create beliefs, it can create uh, feelings in people, um, but it can also it can also mask things. And so figuring out when language is important versus versus when it's just trying to to hide things. Um, is is difficult. So would you say that that the language that we use here um, is really important to fight over? Like, um, would you fight to maybe fight's not the, a great word, but would you advocate for continuing to use the word that you are a gay Christian? Um, how important do you think that is? And and in regard to language, I think what's important is our doctrine of Christian freedom which is that the gospel allows us to be far worse sinners than we ever realized we were and far more loved and secure in the arms of Jesus. And that our standing in the Christian community does not hinge on how we describe our experience. And as Christians, we have no need to control how someone describes their experience. For someone who was LGBT activist, they understood gay to be the center of their being. It defined who they were. It wasn't uh, descriptive, but it was prescriptive that they had to be true to themselves, you know? And, and so they were engaging in all sorts of sexual sin and they had various partners and they had all this stuff. And, and, and then they become a Christian. They may not want to call themselves gay, even though 
in terms of the orientation. They are, but they may prefer to use language like same-sex attraction or something like that because they're trying to get away from the old them that had defined them. Uh, and yet for somebody who was raised Christian and went through 20 years of ex-gay ministry and conversion therapy, you know, that language of same-sex attraction is incredibly triggering. And to tell them that they have to use that language, you are doing violence to them and will stand before God for that because that is part of the abuse they experienced at the hands of Christian leaders who lied to them and all the other pastors who were silent while it was happening. And, and so, you know, for them, where they for 20 years were told to lie and say, I'm not gay anymore. I used to be gay, but now I'm a Christian and God has delivered me, though I may still struggle with some same-sex attraction. Uh, that, you know, that language, when they were given language that was used basically to conceal their story, to hide, because the church didn't want gay people around. They wanted, they didn't want in process Christians. They wanted fully arrived Christians. And, uh, and so for them, it's going to be very important that they call themselves gay to be honest, to be real, that this is a part of me. This is a part of my story. This is not all in my head. And I think so, a lot of Christians and their arrogance think it is all in their head um, when, when science says otherwise. And so I think the, the main thing is allow people to describe their own story. You know, somebody who, um, you know, a recovering alcoholic, when they, describe themselves as an alcoholic, it's not because they're glorifying alcohol. It's because they are trying to tell a story about something that has impacted their life massively. And uh, and when you're dealing with a Christian who is same-sex attracted or gay, you're dealing with something that has had a major impact on their life and has brought a lot of suffering, a lot of hardship, but um, also something that God is willing to use in us as he uses everything for his own glory. So it seems like for, for the gay Christian, you know, sanctification wasn't available to them, only glorification. You either, you either arrive or you don't. They weren't allowed the process. Yeah, because, because the expectation was that sanctification means you are no longer tempted. And that's a standard we never put on straight men. Um, you know, that's tying up heavy burdens that you yourself cannot carry and not offering a finger to help. So one of the the things that you just said about, um, you know, uh, the language, you know, changing to same-sex attraction, you said two things. You said, first of all, that to somebody who's gone through that period of time, um, that was experienced as abuse. Like that language was was used and it it was abuse. But first then off. second- Okay. Yeah. And then you also said that um, uh, by and large, that language is kind of used to mask. And that's kind of the the, the feeling that I, I get from the research that I've done and, and the people that I've talked to. Um, it, it, and one of the things that I think you highlight really well in your book that just um, is a is an unfortunate picture that just kind of clicks as to like, oh yeah, I, I can see how that would be really damaging because I think sometimes it's hard to understand how language is damaging if you haven't experienced that language as abusive. But when you talk about, uh, you know, as part of conversion therapy, you know, a, a gay man um, going and learning how to throw a football or change the oil or uh, to walk a particular way, you know, as if as if those things had a connection to making one heterosexual. Um, and you used a phrase uh, in that section. You said something like um, uh, propagandizing an ideal is what they were trying to do in, in uh, gay men in particular. So that seems like basically what we're, we're calling it this conversion. We're trying to convert people. But what we're really doing is just like with the language, we're, we're masking people. We're kind of trying to, to paint over it. Very Why often conversion therapy. Yeah, very often it was it was teaching us to better hide in our closet more deeply. Why, why are those outward appearances so important for the church? If you're, if you're hiding in the closet and you're not really being converted or transformed, um, yeah. 
why why did the church care so much about something that really only changed the outward appearances? Yeah, you know, I think there is a long history of moralism within North American religion in general and Christianity in particular. Um, you know, it's the you know because legalism by its nature it seeks um, measurable quantifiable spiritual growth. And the thing about real spiritual growth is it's not measurable. You know, how do you measure coveting? How do you measure the pride of life? You know, <laughs> how do you measure um, loving your neighbor as yourself? You know, these are very difficult things. But what we can quantify is whether I watch R-rated movies, whether I listen to secular music, whether I wear, you know, certain types of clothing or certain types of makeup or certain kinds of hairstyle, um, whether I drink whiskey or Sanka, you know, those are things that are very easily, easily quantified. And in American conservative evangelical history, we have tended to gravitate towards things that are measurable because we're basically all a bunch of legalists trying to, trying to figure out the gospel. Um, but we think that the gospel is for the non-Christian to become a Christian. And then you start relating to God based upon rules. And, and typically there are man-made rules that build a fence around the law that keep you from getting too close to, to sin, but actually do nothing to address the issues of the heart. And, you know, St. Paul in Colossians says that these, these regulations have an appearance of wisdom, but they're of no value in restraining sensual indulgence. And so, you know, if it's like, okay, take the Sanka, not the whiskey, see the PG movie, not the R-rated movie, listen to Christian music, not secular music, say same-sex attracted, not gay. You know, just it's just another thing where we it, it functions as a shibboleth to say, oh, he's one of us or he's one of them. Because our folks would say it this way and theirs say it that way. Um, uh, it was actually D.A. Carson, Don Carson, who first called it a shibboleth, to my knowledge, um, the, the sexual identity languages uh, in his endorsement to Gregory Coles's book, Single Gate Christian. Um, but uh, but yeah, we, we tend to uh, miss the gospel and and want to replace it by outward things that tell us or tell the church, or tell the world that we're making progress. And, you know. For me, you know, I knew I was gay when I was 11 years old. Um, I was glued. My eyes were glued to a groomsman in a wedding, and I just would have done anything for that groomsman, whatever he wanted at the time. And, and I've never been sexually attracted to a woman. Sexual temptation for me has always been toward males, not most males. 99% would be just disgusting at the thought, but, you know. But when I am tempted, it's always a male. And so like, well, Greg, what has sanctification done if it hasn't made you sexually attracted to women instead? I mean, obviously, if you were really growing in Christ, you'd quit lusting after men and start lusting after women and looking at female porn. What? And you think, well, that's that's a really low standard. you know. <laughs> and yet what sanctification has meant for me is, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've never so much as held hands. Uh, never had an erotic hug, never snuggled with another guy, never had sex in any form. I've been off of pornography for about 17, 18 years. I've lost track. Um, and it, it means that there are places I don't go because, and this is different for everybody. Don't go make a bunch of rules out of this. Then that will defeat the whole purpose. But for me, I've never joined a gym because I don't want to be around a locker room where I might be tempted to follow somebody in because I'm curious and that wouldn't be good for me. Um, uh, you know, I, I go in a restroom and I figure, is there a urinal with an empty urinal on either side or do I need to go to a stall? You know, just because of what I might see, you know, that they're, you know, having covenant eyes on my, on my internet access and meeting every week with, for over 20 years now, with one of my elders, uh, same elder, to, to pray and for accountability and, you know, trying to look the other way, like any other Christian guy should be doing 
when temptation is faced um, and dealing and, and more proactively addressing um, the longings of the heart, the God-given longings of the heart that sin tries to use to our advantage to tempt us. And so making sure I'm building community and I have intimacy and community and I'm known and I'm giving and receiving real love so that I'm not tempted to fake it in my imagination. You know, that's what sanctification looks like in, in practice, not temptation switching genders. That's not likely to happen. Yeah. Uh, that you're talking about sanctification and you know, that reminds me of, uh, of one of the things that you talked about as well in your book. Um, and, and something that, it's a word for me that, uh, as I do this season on propaganda, I it, it's it's what I I think is you know the the Christians' form of counter propaganda. Uh, it, it's the way that we we fight lies and manipulation and and deception, and that's discipleship, which is which is really just social social uh, um, sanctification. You know, it's it's being sanctified together with other people, like Hebrews ten twenty four. Um, you know, come together, don't, don't forsake that and build each other up. And one of the, one of the places that I think you highlight that in your book is you include a, a quote from Nancy Gritter, I believe. And she says something to the extent of that uh, we're to be pastoral, not political uh, partners, not empire relational, not pragmatic. And then the last one is what kind of got me. Cause I agreed with the first part. She said, we're to seek discipleship, not change. You know, I had to really think about that one for a bit because I, I agree with the discipleship, but the but yeah, the discipleship should include change. But then, as I was thinking about your example of of the football, you know, I of teaching gay guys how to throw a football, I was like, oh, I, I think what she means is that she's saying, you know, discipleship is is transformational from the inside out, but change is you know like a like a paint job over over a rusty car or something. You know, it's it's just something that that looks nice on the outside. And um, when we seek somebody to change like that, we're basically, we're objectifying them. We're like, you know what? We don't really care about you. We just want to slap some paint on you to kind of, to look good. And that's, that's objectification. That's not discipleship. And I think what you helped me to understand more is that I, I think the church a lot of times does this we think that we're trying to change the person for their good, but what we're really doing is we're objectifying them um, sometimes for our good, you know, uh, to say, well, look what we did. We created this person who, who looks good now uh, or whatever our reasons are. Um, or like you said, we, we like numbers. So a, a lot of, a lot of people care about converts. They don't care about disciples, even though the great commission is about disciple making, not, not convert making. Um, and we seek polemics, we seek, we seek empire so that we can control and we can force change on people. Why do you think, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the importance of discipleship, kind of expound on that, because I know you, you do that really well in your book. So what is the importance of discipleship and why is the church conflating discipleship with, with um, you know, outward change and why are we getting it so wrong? Yeah, and of course, that word change in an ex-gay ministry context has a, a lot of meaning because the, you know, the, the motto of Exodus International was change is possible. And the change was orientation change, <laughs> not a transformed life, but a sexual orientation change. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, discipleship is messy. Discipleship happens in community. Community only works where people can be fully known, um, where they can let somebody in. And, you know, I don't even like to think about coming out. I, I prefer to think of it as me letting people in, um, letting people see the real me, warts and all, as a fallen creature made in God's image and a subject of, of Christ's redemption. And... You know, discipleship only happens where we can be seen all the way down and still be accepted because that's what does the gospel ministry in us. And when we tell somebody that they can't be honest um, about their sexual orientation, that they have to fake it, we are cutting them off completely from the path of discipleship. Um, you know, if 
if an alcoholic can't be open and honest about their alcoholism, their addictive disorder, whatever you want to call it, um, whether they're rolling out of a bar at three in the morning or whether they've been sober for 20 years is beside the point. If they can't be honest about it, then they cannot experience discipleship because discipleship is the application of the gospel in community. That means full disclosure and complete acceptance. Not that we have to have full disclosure to everybody, but we have to have full disclosure to some people. You know, there are, you know, it is, it is the secret sin that is, that has power over us. And um, when we can be open and honest, that allows for us to be known in community. And, and for that to happen, the church needs to think of itself as family first and foremost, not worship and programs. Um, but we are a worshiping family. That means, you know, having the single gay person go on vacation with you, having them, adopting them into your family or adopting her into your family. And I've had Christian women say, oh, but I couldn't have such people near my child. And all I can say is you're probably not even regenerate. You know, there's just nothing of the gospel in you. If you honestly think we're all pedophiles, you're crazy because again, the science proves otherwise. <laughs> you know, there have been studies that show that, you know, there was one study done many years ago of, of all of the um, child sex offenders in the state of Massachusetts, and it found that of all of them, they looked at how many were sexually attracted to adult women, how many were sexually attracted to adult men, and how many of them were fixated or just attracted to children and not adults at all. And, and they, they found that... Um, most of them were either fixated or heterosexual in their attractions, and none of them were gay. Not a single one was attracted to other men. And, and it makes sense because if you're attracted to muscles and testosterone, an eight-year-old doesn't have those, you know? But this notion that you have to protect them. Anyway, I, I digress, but it's, it's just, you know, we have to pull those parts of the body that seem less presentable they need to be brought into the center of the church, not pushed out to the periphery. And, uh, you know, you should, you know, sexual orientation should not be an, uh, should not be a ter determining factor in figuring out who you're going to love, who you're going to invite into your home, to whom you're going to offer hospitality, um, who you're going to take on vacation with you. You should want people of Christian character near your kids whatever temptation they face is beside the point. Yeah. As I, as I uh, dug into this more and I've, I've listened to uh, and read Preston Sprinkle a bit too, who I really like yep. um, as he, he just, he has really good questions and he just has such a, a good heart. Um, and he, he talks to all kinds of people across the spectrum. Um, and I just realized I was like, you know, if you're, if you're gay or if you're single, um, and in, at least in, in the PCA with, with our demographics, if you're uh, a minority, it's like, where, where are you really going to go where you're going to feel um, loving community that that envelops you and brings you in to edify you? And it's mm -hmm. just it's so it's so hard. And I think not just the PCA, I think I think evangelicalism in, in general in the States has difficulty with with singles and with, uh, gay people. Um, and yeah, one of the, one of the things that has been popping up for me a lot, uh, lately is, um, this, this term, uh, eudaimonism and it's, um, you know, it's this concept that like, basically God created a good world. And so you'd expect that if you do the right things that, uh, you know, if you do righteous things that, that that will produce the best results, and it's not the it's not the um, you know health and wealth gospel uh, type of thing. It's just it's kind of like proverbs, you know, in generalities. If you do this, then this tends to follow. Uh, it, it's wisdom, and one of the things that that strikes me about that is I would expect that um, if we have the spirit of God, if God exists, if He created a good world. Um, we should be producing fruits and that fruit should not be rotten yet. You know, one of the stats that stuck out to me that as I was watching one of your interviews is that whatever it is that we're doing as a church, 
it seems that we're producing rotten fruit because you you quoted something. I might get the number wrong here, but uh, like a thirty seven percent higher suicide rate if a a gay person is associated with I don't know if it's religion in general or Christianity. And to me, that just seems like that just blows my mind that the church wouldn't produce better results than that if we're doing the right thing in God's good world. So maybe you could talk a little bit about about that stat and and talk about what that indicates about how the church is doing and whether or not we're following God's prerogative. Yeah, it was in a 2000 uh, a study using data from 2011 of 21,000 plus college students. Um, for example, found that, um, you know, for straight students, if they were religious, they had a lower rate of suicidal ideation than secular students. But for gay and lesbian students, it was actually, um, they were 38% more likely to have had recent suicidal thoughts. And um, for lesbians only, it was actually a 52% increased likelihood of, of suicidal thinking. And there are a lot of studies like this that look at, now they tend to look just generally at the impact of being religious as opposed to irreligious. And so that's going to lump in Hasidic Jews. That's going to lump in, you know, right-wing Roman Catholics, the independent Bible Baptists, everybody, Muslim students, you name it, um, Christian scientists. Uh, but um, but with the prevalence of Christianity in, in North America, you know, clearly that reflects to some degree on the church. And, and again, I think the issue is, is a lack of gospel culture in so many of our churches, including Reformed and Presbyterian churches, uh, back often. Um, and, you know, when it, when a church is saturated by the gospel, then not only the pulpit, but the people are free to be sinners loved by Jesus. They're free to be open and honest because they know that they've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ and all their sins have been forgiven. So not only are they forgiven, but they fed the 5,000, they raised Lazarus from the dead, and they always did what pleased the Father because they're united to Jesus in whom all of those things are true and his righteousness has been reckoned. And that gives you to them. And so it gives you this incredible freedom to be open and honest. And when a church gets the gospel on that deep level um, where they know that the only class of people Jesus called are sinners. Um, it's that's when you see 80 year old men talking about their struggle with lust and explaining how it doesn't ever really go away. Um, you know, they, they may no longer be able to have sex, but that doesn't mean their minds are suddenly pure and angelic. You know, uh, that's where, um, couples that struggle with infertility can be open and honest because it's safe and it won't be a whole bunch of people telling them what to do to fix it. It'll just be people who can empathize with them because they too know suffering uh, and they too know what it's like to be broken and damaged by the fall. Um, that's when your addicts can talk about their addiction open, openly. That's when married couples can talk about how difficult their marriage is and how they struggle to forgive and love each other. Um, that's when your, you know, 13 year old in youth group feels comfortable telling his youth pastor about his questions about his sexuality or gender confusion. You know, that's where it's safe for gay people to follow Jesus and not be told that they need to pretend to be straight, lie about their orientation changing and use euphemisms. Um, you know, that's, that's the reality. And so, you know, to some degree, God's law kills. That's what the Bible says. The law kills, the gospel gives life, the spirit gives life. And there's a part of me that God's holy law had to kill and has to keep killing. The part of me that's proudful and arrogant and lustful and objectifies people. I might be more tempted to objectify a man than a woman, but I'm still doing the same sin. Uh, and it's the temptation still there. And so, um, you know, learning to love with the generosity of Jesus, with the compassion to love others for their sake, to love God for his own sake, because he's worthy of love, um, to grow that heart of Jesus inside of me, that takes the gospel. 
It's the gospel that teaches us to say no to sin, um, not the law. And where American churches are focused on rule keeping, they're pointing the finger at those sinners out there instead of the sinners in here, um, where it becomes about performance and looking religious and looking spiritual, um, that kills because that's law. Where the gospel takes root and gospel centered churches are a small minority of American churches, including conservative churches. Um, but where the gospel takes real root, um, you know, some Presbyterians roll their eyes and say, oh, the grace guys. Well, that says, sadly, a great deal about the state of their soul if they're rolling their eyes at grace, because it's all we've got. And, you know, all my eggs are in Jesus' basket. And I'm just like, Jesus, I'm giving up everything for you. I sold everything I had and I bought the field because you're my buried treasure. All my eggs are in your basket. You better not be lying, Lord, because you're my only hope in life and in death. You know, and you know me. You know what I am. I am totally capable of all kinds of sin. You know, I don't have to, when I sin, I don't have to say, no, honestly, I'm not that kind of guy. I am totally that kind of guy. That's why I need a savior. And to come to his grace again and again and again and drink of it and feel his love and delight washing over you and him singing over you in song and carving your name into the palm of his hand. You know, that's when you know you have a dad who loves you in heaven. You know, that, that enables a freedom. And so I think it's interesting because when you look at some of the research, you know, that, that Mark Yarhouse and, and uh, Olya um, uh, Zeprosits published back in 2019 under the title um, Costly Obedience, Learning from, you know, Celibate Gay Christians, you know, their research of 355 gay, lesbian, bisexual, same-sex attracted believers who were committed to the biblical sexual ethic found that by and large, psychologically, by every objective standard, they're doing really well. The, the ones who are single, unmarried, and celibate, um, are going to struggle more with loneliness and finding community in churches that build everything around family ministries and marriage. Um, but, um, but by and large, they were doing really well. And so, you know, that's a bit of scientific research that gives a counterpoint. I think the difference is the presence of the gospel. Not as something for non-Christians, but the bread that we feast on every day. Yeah, that was that was transformational for me coming into uh, the PCA when uh, I think we went through gospel transformations and I was like the gospel. I mean, yeah, I, I prayed that prayer when I was like, you know, five. <laughs> what, what, why are we talking about the gospel? I, we're, I'm not here to evangelize. I'm here to grow. And uh, yeah, that is just so it's so beautiful um, when when that does become a part of your life. And it is, it is freeing. And I think that highlights one of the things that you point out so well is the the difference between guilt and shame. And I, I don't remember exactly how you put it, but guilt is maybe something you've done and shame is more who you are um, type of thing. And, you know, the irony of um, people being upset with you saying that you are a gay Christian who is, who is, um, you know, trying to mortify the flesh um, are often the, the same group who are creating shame, which says, this is who you are, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've often said, you know, my critics and opponents spend a lot more time talking about my sexuality than I ever have. Uh, and that's just downright creepy. I mean, it, it really is like the thought that there are all of these religious people sitting around the table on Sunday morning, discussing my sexuality when, I mean, my sexuality is like a 1972 Ken doll that's still shrink wrapped in its original packaging, you know, like, like why are they talking about this? You know, uh, it's the thing I try not to think about all the time. Um, but um, yeah, you know, they're, they're very big at shaming people. And yeah, you're right. The difference is guilt relates to what I've done and shame relates to what I am as a creature affected by the fall as one that's so much less than the best of humanity, so much less than was intended. And, and of course, it's, it's interesting because, you know, most of the world functions as a shame-based cultural ethic. Um, it's, it's really Western Europeans and Americans are sort of the weird ones and that we're not primarily a shame-driven culture. Um, much more a legal guilt 
focus culture. But where you see it in North America is very different is when you're dealing with um, uh, Asian Americans, immigrant families, first, second, third generation, uh, or people raised in very conservative religious contexts where shame is a massive manipulator and everybody's trying to avoid shame. But it's used as a lever to gain control over people. And, and of course, what Jesus does in terms of like, I, I often talk about the pastor's toolbox, you know, as pastors, we have certain, we, we want to help people not sin. And so we have a toolbox with certain tools in it. And, you know, you got the hammer and that's guilt manipulation. You can beat people up with guilt manipulation, tell them how horrible they are, what an awful thing they've done. And you get short-term results, but you end up bashing their head in, in the process. And so Jesus takes that away and says, I atoned for all their sins. There, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So he takes away the hammer. And then I pull out, you know, the Phillips screwdriver, very, very handy. That's shame, shame manipulation. Shame can do things that a hammer can never do. Shame can screw something in or screw it out. You know, shame says you're defective. Look at you. If people only knew. Uh, and uh, Jesus says, no, I've clothed this one in the righteousness of Christ. They now have my resume. They have been given the Congressional Medal of Honor and ushered into the, the halls of power. So shame, he takes that away. And then there's, you know, people pleasing, fear of what others will think. That's maybe the wrench. And he takes that away. And then there's the fear of punishment. You're going to go to hell if you do that. And he takes that away. And ultimately, what's left in the, the pastor's toolbox is just the gospel. Um, even when exercising church discipline, we're merely declaring that one is not walking in line with the gospel. Um, you know, it's a declarative ministry. It's not judicial. And, uh, you know, all we've got is grace. And the more I tell people how much Jesus loves them, uh, the more it sinks in and they actually want to serve him. And that's, that's uh, true for gay people as well as for straight people. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good reminder to me too. You know, as a parent, I think uh, I have that same toolbox, and unfortunately, I use the hammer uh, more than I should. I think. Um, all right, a last question for you. Um, all right. I I think it's really easy for me um, at, at this time in my life, at this time in history, whatever it is, to be um, to to be frustrated. I think with with the church at the moment, or to be disillusioned by it, and um, you know, it, while while there are definitely things that that I I think are important to point out because I love the church and I want to fix it, and you love the church too. I mean, you're a pastor, uh, I'm doing missions work, and we love the church. Um, I, I think it would be uh, it, it wouldn't be fair if I spent the whole time just talking about the church. And not acknowledging that, um, you know, of, of course, there are issues elsewhere, too. So if, if you could close, I know that you said you've received um, hate mail from from Christians and uh, and people like that. But I would imagine that as somebody who is who is religious, receiving religious hate mail for um, still identifying as gay, yet at the same time, um, not approving of a gay lifestyle, I would imagine that you maybe sometimes get hate mail from the other side too, or or maybe negative interactions. I'd love for you to kind of just close out by talking about maybe some of the the experiences that you've had receiving a lack of love and charity from the other side, and uh, or, or uh, some of the, the their scientific viewpoints and and uh, refusals to accept. Uh, maybe what science shows in terms of of uh, the lifestyle or or where that leads. Yeah, you know, I have had some some negative interactions with those on the other side, far more from conservative religious people. Um, you know, most folks on the kind of secular LGBT side, they they think it's weird that I'm celibate and that I'm probably not being true to who I am. I'm repressed and self-hating and, and they hate that. And, and occasionally somebody will get very, very heated, uh, claiming that, that, 
the Christian ethic that I hold to is inherently violent to gay people and that I'm therefore fermenting youth suicides and all that kind of stuff. Um, and because they're assuming that my message is one of law rather than gospel, uh, because they're just focused on the one aspect of sexual norms and, and not the bigger picture of, of the gospel in which that's discussed. And, uh, so yeah, I've had to block some folks on Twitter who were, you know, activists and who were just constantly accusing. And and I tried to be gracious. I tried to interact. I tried to be positive. Eventually, I just had to say, this person's trolling me. I got to block them. Um, you know, when we hosted the Revoice at, when Memorial Present St. Louis hosted the Revoice Conference in 2018, uh, the first conference. Um, you know, we were denounced in the local LGBT media. Uh, for promoting conversion therapy 2.0, which is what they viewed celibacy as. And there were calls to picket us, to picket our church during the conference that it never happened. Um, but, you know, out of that, I was able to reach out to some of those activists and, and sit down with them, including one young man who, who had gone through some form of, you know, conversion therapy said through a, a through a, a, um, a counselor that at the time was using space in our building. And so he had gone through it as a teenager in our building. And I was able to hear his story and ask his forgiveness. And he's, he's the, you know, vice president of, of pride St. Louis and heads up the local, you know, LGBT community center. And so I was able to ask his forgiveness because we didn't protect him. Love always protects. And we let that happen. And uh, I was able to establish a positive relationship there. There's another, activist who's a, a ethical humanist minister um atheist uh, gay um was able to meet with him because he was the one calling for pickets and we had drinks together one one, one afternoon and and when he heard my story he, he had, wanted to say okay so you're you're gay atheist and you became a christian why would you have done that and I'm, I just asked him, are you asking for my Christian testimony? He's like, yeah, I love hearing things like this. And so, you know, here I was able to, you know, talk about Jesus with people who um, might not be able to hear that from very many sources, but, but they could hear it from me. Um, I remember, you know, we have an arts venue where we serve all sorts of non-Christian artists. It's a ministry to the artists themselves where... They come in and do their art from their perspective. They, they could be Jewish, atheist, humanist, Hindu, Muslim, LGBTQIA, whatever. It doesn't matter to us. We're just there to love people. And uh, we have some expectations of what kind of art we do we host, but um, but we don't censor. And we had one theater company that did a group of plays written by transgender playwrights exploring gender dysphoria and this sense of separation from one's physical body. Uh, some of it was science fiction, but it was really fascinating. It was good, really interesting stuff, really eye-opening for somebody who's never experienced gender dysphoria. Um, but, uh, you know, afterwards, our, our pastors actually ran the bar. We give away free drinks. That's the, the thing. We give the space free and we give drinks to their patrons for free, you know, beer, wine, and soda, uh, just to, to love them and so that they know that there were Christians who didn't judge them and did love them and treated them with respect. Um, and so our pastors ran the bar each night and our youth and family guy, the last night he was running the bar and afterwards when almost everybody was gone, one of the actresses came up to him and said, we all know what your church believes. And so we don't understand why you're treating us this way. You know, cause we were so loving and caring and, compassionate and they didn't understand it and he was able to hear her out and share some of how we, we actually do this precisely because of what we believe because when we were his enemies Jesus died for us when we were different he came and loved us and entered into our experience and so we want to love people who are different from us whether they agree with us or not um, whatever the perspective we want to love them and and we know how much ill will has been fostered by Christians and by churches toward LGBT people. And so we want to, to, to address that by not telling you all the stuff that we believe, but just loving you. 
And she talked for about 45 minutes. She had a lot of stuff on her chest. But at the end of the day, she walked out of that chapel, that arts venue, and said, this is the first time I feel like a Christian has respected me. Um, that's that's pre-evangelism, at least. <laughs> you know, that is inroads for the gospel, bridges for the gospel of Jesus into a secular world. And people criticized us for it, but, you know, I would always point out, I can't remember if it was Dwight Moody or Billy Sunday, but some prominent lady criticized his evangelistic methods and his response was, ma'am, I like what I'm doing better than what you're not doing. And when it comes to ministering to LGBT people, American churches, the ones that actually believe the gospel, aren't doing much. There's a lot we can do. And yet it's always from beneath by loving them, by serving them. You know, the way Jesus reached my heart and captured my soul and made me want to obey him is not because he became my Lord, but because he became my savior. Because he got down on his feet. When my feet were dirty, he got down on his knees and washed my feet. When I was guilty and his enemy, he went to death on the cross and absorbed the father's wrath for my sake so that I would never have to absorb it at all. He drank the cup of God's wrath down to the dregs so that I would never see it. And, and that's the way, you know, when we think about influencing a culture, um, Presbyterians, unfortunately, often on the left or the right, they think if we can just get our guys into power on top, we can force all the non-Christians to act like Christians when the Christians don't even act like Christians. Um, that is what Jesus said is the, the way the, the rulers of the Gentiles exercise authority over them. He said, it must not be with you. Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. Um, and the way we're going to influence a culture is not by getting our people on top politically, but by getting our people on the bottom, serving LGBT people, serving non-Christians, serving atheists, serving critics, serving people who hate us, and, and letting the gospel do its work. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I uh, I love the image of of the upside down kingdom. I think that's such a such a fitting uh, fitting analogy, fitting picture. That's uh, that's all I have for you. Um, so I I really appreciate you taking more than an hour out of your time. It actually went went longer than I was expecting. Um, is there anything else you'd like to to plug or say or any, any closing thoughts? No, just. Uh... Check out my book, Still Time to Care, What We Can Learn from the Church's Failed Attempt to Cure Homosexuality. You'll learn all about, in the first chapter, C.S. Lewis and his gay best friend, Arthur. Um, and uh, you'll learn all about um, what the late Francis Schaeffer had to say about, you know, uh, uh, his first encounter uh, with Jerry Falwell Sr. Um, when he said, that man is disgusting over his homophobia. Uh, you know, there's a great history to learn. And last I checked, it was about $5 on Amazon, which is cheaper than I can buy it from my own publisher. So uh, go and buy a crate and give them to all your friends. It's a great way to learn about Jesus. All right. Well, thank you so much again. All right, Derek. Thanks. That's all for now. So peace. And because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.